Okay. Good evening, everyone. Let me make sure I share my next screen here. Okay, just making sure everyone can see my screen before I get started. Checking. Okay, everyone, thank you and welcome to the first virtual museum lecture of the season of the year of 2021. Thank you all to everyone who's joined us this evening. Our community is filled with diverse stories and we recognize that our story begins with the indigenous peoples of this land. We acknowledge that we are broadcasting this lecture on lands that have been inhabited by Indigenous peoples for millennia. And we would like to honor the centuries of Indigenous peoples who walked on Turtle Island before us. My name is Sarah, and I am a public programmer here at the St. Catharines Museum and Welland Canal Center. And I am thrilled to be joined tonight by Rochelle Bush, resident historian at the BME Salem Chapel here in St. Catharines. And we are so excited to welcome everyone back to the Virtual Museum Lecture Series. We hope that these lectures provide a bit of historical joy and also spark imagination and exploration of our city's history. A quick note uh, for those watching on mobile devices, please check your audio settings on your YouTube app if you're having any audio problems. And you may also uh, not have access to uh, the chat box, so you can always post comments or questions in the regular comments below the video. Uh, so please, you are um, welcome to ask questions in the chat and we'll moderate at the end of the presentation. Um, but before we start tonight's lecture, uh, let me tell you about our very exciting uh, lineup of lectures for winter 2021. Um, on February 16th, I will be here to discuss the myths of the Underground Railroad and some of the challenges those myths present in interpreting such popular and secretive and fascinating history. Um, I'd also like to uh, quickly pause here to speak briefly about our programming for Black History Month. Um, this includes our two lectures, um, but also a couple of tours that um, our museum is offering of our Black History exhibits. If you would like to participate um, in these um, on fe February 11th, as well as February 21st, please send us an email and we will register you that to those as well. Well, um, also very exciting as part of our Black History programming, Rochelle Bush, our guest tonight, will, will also be a guest blogger on the museum blog, St. Catherine's Museum blog.com, and she'll be posting a, a weekly series exploring the life of Harriet Tubman and her connection to St. Catherine's, John Brown, a couple really um, famous, important names, and their St. Their, uh, Catherine's connection. And you can find that every Saturday, the first three uh, Saturdays in February. So we're very excited to have a guest blog as well. Um, okay, continuing on with our lectures on March 2nd, Adrian will be on to talk about our city's urban development titled No Exit the Dead End Streets of St. Catharines. And on March 16th, our curator Kathleen Powell will be on to discuss the Boer War and our local participation in her talk for King and Country. Oh, this is the uh, <laughs> this is the poster, the the graphic for Kathleen's lecture. 
And then on, uh, on March 30th, we are also very excited to welcome local geographer and former Brock University map librarian Colleen Beard to talk about the history of uh, the history of the Welland Canal's mapping project. So she'll be on on March 30th. And then on April 13th, for something a little different, uh, we're very excited to welcome students from the Brock, uh, University, Brock University uh, Historical Society to present a mini symposium on recent undergraduate work. And finally, on April 27th, uh, we'll close out the winter series with um, a very special guest, author and historian, Dr. Tim Cook, who will give us a, a talk on remembering the Second World War and his new book, Fighting for History. And we are also working on a lineup for the fall museum lecture series as well. Um, so if there's anything that you'd love us to delve deeper into, uh, please send us a note and we'll, we'll try and include it. We are also very busy working on an upcoming exhibit, just a line to say, postcards um, from the museum's collection. And we're looking uh, to members of the community to submit their modern day postcards from recent travels as well. Um, whether it's a souvenir postcard you've collected or a postcard you received from a friend, we'd love to include it in the exhibit um, as we reminisce about postcards. So to submit a postcard, please reach out to Adrian by email at at museum at stcatherines.ca. Uh, this exhibit will open in the spring. I sincerely hope that everyone has been enjoying our virtual museum lecture series. And I would, I'd love to encourage you to make a donation to the museum in support of our programming. Your donation helps us to continue the high quality and enjoyable programming that you've really come to expect from us. And we really appreciate any donation uh, that you're able to make. So you can either call us at 905-984-8880 or at museum at stcatherines.ca to give us an email. Your donations do make a difference. Thank you. Okay, now, uh, without further ado, we will introduce our special guest. Hi, Rochelle. Uh, we will introduce Rochelle Bush is a descendant of African American freedom seekers and was born here in St. Catharines. She is the proprietor and primary guide of Tubman Tours Canada and the resident historian of the Salem Chapel BME Church, Harriet Tubman Underground Railroad National Historic Site. Uh, Rochelle is also a member of the Historical Society of St. Catharines, a past board member of the St. Catharines Museum, an honorary member of the Central Ontario Network for Black History, a certified Niagara Tourism Ambassador, and a Niagara Parks Guide. Over 20 years ago, Rochelle began to preserve, promote, and protect Niagara's rich Black history, and this includes participating in the development of the early Black history narrative and government tourism initiatives. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Rochelle tonight, and please enjoy her talk titled Visiting Abolitionists. Welcome, Rochelle. Well, thank you, Sarah. Wonderful introduction. I greatly appreciate that. Oh, thank you so much. Okay, let me get your presentation ready here. Okay. Awesome. Now, if you want to take control of the PowerPoint. I did. And I want to wish everybody a happy Black History Month. And bear in mind, this is my maiden voyage, my first time. So here we go. So we got the first screen. Are we good? We are good. Excellent. 
So what I want to say is, if you want to learn more about the African enslavement, the transatlantic slave trade, institutionalized slavery, also known as chattel slavery in Canada or the US, and the Underground Railroad, you can learn all of that online. This talk is about the anti-slavery movement. It's about abolitionists, so people who wanted to end slavery. And you'll note throughout the talk that there's a difference between moral persuasion. So a lot of the clergy were moving towards moral persuasion. They were against uprising and violence, whereas some of the clergy agreed with both. So that will be mentioned as well. So first up is Hiram Wilson. So he was an American born abolitionist and a Canadian resident. So he resided in Canada between 1838 and 1864, but he also became the station manager at St. Catharines. So he's the primary abolitionist. He's not a visiting abolitionist. The number one abolitionist in St. Catharines would be this guy, William Hamilton Merritt. So he was a Canadian abolitionist and he was in St. Catharines and Niagara. And as you can see that portrait's from 1860. So Merritt was born into a loyalist family in New York state in 1793. Two years later, the family moved to Upper Canada and they settled in this area. He was a War of 1812 veteran and he was a merchant, an industrialist, as well as a local politician. We're also not gonna talk about this lady, Harriet Tubman, because she wasn't a visiting abolitionist. She was a resident here in St. Catharines between 1851 and 1861, truly early 1862. So we know all about Tubman. She was an underground railroad conductor, but she was not a visiting abolitionist. So back to Hiram Wilson. As the primary abolitionist, Wilson would receive many people. So he was born in New Hampshire where he was said to have inherited a New England dedication to moral upliftment. So this is where the moral persuasion comes in. His education began when he attended the Oneida Institute in upstate New York, and it was a manual labor school. By 1833, he had moved on to the Lane Theological Seminary in Cincinnati. Um, you know, there was a difference of opinion there. At Lane, some people wanted to talk about slavery, others did not. So there was a division, a number of them of almost 70, I believe it's 70 of the Lane rebels moved on. Wilson went on to Oberlin College. So he graduated from there at Oberlin in 1836. So he received his um, theological degree, but at Oberlin, it was a welcoming college. It was an abolitionist college. They allowed for people of African descent to join as well as women. So after graduating, um, the president of Oberlin, Charles Finney, offered him a position. Finney wanted people to venture around Upper Canada to see how freedom seekers were actually living. So Wilson decided that yes, he would do that. So for the next six years, he traveled around Upper Canada. That's the picture of Oberlin College that he attended. And during that time around 1843, he joined the American Anti-Slavery Society. In the same year, he attended the World Anti-Slavery Convention in England. So while he's traveling around Upper Canada, you see all the settlements? So you have Oro at the top, Owen Sound, Collingwood, you have Windsor at the bottom left, and then you have Kingston as well. So I decided to mention one of his pieces of correspondence in Kingston because I think it's important. This is a picture of the Kingston Penitentiary from 1891. Wilson visits there. And this is what his thoughts were in this letter. He would rather see freedom seekers go to a British penitentiary than American slavery. How deep is that? especially if they had in any, any saying, you can read the top part, if the person had a skin color not like his own, he would rather see them incarcerated rather than be enslaved. Something else that was important that he noted was five out of 10,000 fugitives from American slavery were in the British penitentiary. So 
10,000 people in Upper Canada, Wilson notes that five men are institutionalized while they're incarcerated, which is amazing. By 1838, Wilson decides he's going to settle in Upper Canada, but he remains an American abolitionist. He does not become naturalized. Hiram Wilson moves to St. Catharines in November, 1850. And this is because he has a fallout with friends while they're establishing the Dawn settlement. So it was in the Dresden area. He was working with Josiah Henson. So after a number of years, there was disruption, fi a financial breakdown, and Wilson decided I've had enough. I'm going to relocate. So he moves to St. Catharines. St. Catharines, this is St. Paul Street, the Broadway of the area, we all know that. So the top is St. Catharines, uh, St. Paul Street, West End looking east, the bottom corner of St. Paul Street and Ontario Street, and then of course, St. Paul Street looking east again, and that is the St. Paul Methodist Church in the background. What was also important that he noted, the Welland Canal. So these are reasons why Wilson is moving here. So that's St. Paul Street again with the Welland Canal in the background. And of course, you can see the picture circa 1885. Another thing that was important, St. Catharines was a major tourist attraction. William Hamilton Merritt, who I mentioned already, noticed or he started to develop the Salt Springs back in 1817. By 1855, it's a major tourist attraction. So healing water, healing baths, mineral waters, I should say, and salt baths. And then in 1855, the Grand Stevenson House opens with 200 rooms. 1856, a year later, the Welland House Hotel is built and it's built by predominantly people of African descent. Major tourist attraction, a lot of Southerners here during the 1850s, as well as many before, um, who arrived when the grand hotels were not built. So Wilson and his family arrived two months after the 1850 Fugitive Slave Law passes. So he's now here in St. Catharines. He decides to set up the American Missionaries Association. So it's the pamphlet to the left and he's teaching night school, him and his second wife. And they started the night school at the Salem Chapel BME Church. So first up, while Logan, while Wilson is doing all this, we have Jermaine Logan. So Jermaine Logan comes to town and that's because there's an incident that takes place. So Logan is an African-American abolitionist and he's residing in Syracuse, New York. At the age of 21 in 1834, he escapes from bondage. He takes the Underground Railroad and he crosses at Detroit. Now he's in the southwestern Ontario area. So he stops in Chatham, he moves on to Ancaster, he's in Hamilton. While in Hamilton, things don't work out so well for him. So it's now 1837, he has a little bit of money and he moves to St. Catharines. He purchases a home. He doesn't stay in that home because he moves on to Rochester, New York. He's already connected with Wilson. So he's familiarizing himself with these people while he's coming through. And one thing in his narrative, he states that there were no white men to help me along the Underground Railroad as I was passing through Upper Canada. So I thought that was pretty interesting because everything was still forestry. A lot of places weren't developed. And in his narrative, he goes on to speak about Hamilton and how, how it had become a bustling city. So in his opinion, he thought it was a very cosmopolitan area at that time. So while he's here in St. Catharines, he's speaking at the courthouse. So what happened to Logan? The 1850 Fugitive Slave Law passes. It's now October, 1851. The Liberty Bell rings out in Syracuse, New York. A gentleman by the name of William Henry is about to be apprehended. So of course, a riot breaks out. Um, Logan is involved. William Henry escapes. Logan, running for his life, seeks refuge in St. Catharines. 
And of course, he's hosted by his colleague, Hiram Wilson. So they have meetings. This is between October and December. So while this is going on, Harriet Tubman is in Maryland. She's collecting a group of 11 freedom seekers. And that's when she arrives in St. Catharines. So that's just a depiction of her crossing the suspension bridge. Um, I forget the publication that it came from, but if you subtract the two women in the back that are crossing suspension bridge, there's actually 11 freedom seekers there with the exception of the gentleman in the front who's actually receiving them. So that's Tubman right in the center. So while Tubman's here and Logan's here and Wilson's here, Logan's here until May, but during that time, he's socializing with the town's elite. They have a lot of anti-slavery meetings. A lot of them occur at the town hall. They establish the Refugee Slaves Friends Society. Wilson writes a letter to the Voice of the Fugitive, which is a black abolitionist paper out in Windsor. And he states, I'm happy to announce the formation of the Refugee Slaves Friends Society. And he mentions that the Honorable William Hamilton Merritt is included as well as Elias Adams, the town's mayor. Wilson serves as the secretary of the Refugee Slaves Friends Society. So you can find the article online in the Voice of the Fugitive and you'll see at the top, letter from Hiram Wilson, he's writing to uh, Henry Bibb and it states, dear friend Bibb, and he goes on and he gives lengthy detail about that account. Of course, you can find it in the St. Catharines newspapers as well. I just selected the Voice of the Fugitive it was available, it was online, and I wanted to highlight a black abolitionist paper that everybody was connected with. So the Voice of the Fugitive was the first. Wilson, Logan hears from Frederick Douglass that it's safe for him to return to Syracuse in May, so he decides that he would do that. So while he's here in St. Catharines, he's fearing for his life. He writes a letter back to the governor of New York State um, as well as the uh, Attorney General. So Douglas now appears. It is September, 1852. He's writing an article about the Colored Village. And it's published in his um, Douglas paper, but he also had a paper prior to that called the North Star. So Douglas himself was a leading abolitionist. He had escaped. Let me just back that up once. Let's see if I can do this. Hold up. Are you ready, Sarah? Is everybody ready? My maiden voyage. Perfect. So he purchased his freedom in 1846. And then he moved on to Rochester, New York, where he became the station manager from 1847 to 1863. So he had the two newspapers that he was running. And of course, his most famous quote, the Underground Railroad had many branches, but the one that I was connected with had its stations in Baltimore, Wilmington, Philadelphia, New York, Albany, Syracuse, Rochester, and of course, St. Catharines. It's a lengthy quote, and you can find that online as well. But he says in St. Catharines, they were received by the Reverend Hiram Wilson. So let's bear in mind about Wilson again, primary abolitionist. He's connected with Logan. He's connected with Douglas. All three of them have attended the 1851 Colored Convention in Toronto. So that was in September. He's also familiar with the town's elite because Douglas was in and out of St. Catharines. Next up, we have the Reverend Michael Willis. So the Refugee Slaves Friends Society, it was working in conjunction with the Anti-Slavery Society of Canada. So Reverend Michael Willis was born in Scotland. He immigrated to Canada. And in 1851, he became the first and only president of the Anti-Slavery Society of Canada. So he's here and he's conducting a lecture at the town hall. And of course, all of them are railing against slavery. Again, it's moral suasion, but you do have others who are stating, you know what? It's time for violence. So for example, Frederick Douglass, he said the only way to stop the 1850 Fugitive Slave Law was to make it a dead letter. Of course, the clergy would disagree with that because they felt that people could be persuaded through 
love and kindness. Well, how was that working out for them and everybody else? It wasn't. So the formation of the Anti-Slavery Society of Canada, you can find this document online as well. And it lists the committee members. One person I do want to highlight, of course, is John Brown, uh, editor and publisher of the Toronto Globe. So if I had a choice to pick between the provincial leading abolitionists, I would have to go with Reverend Michael Willis and then George Brown. But you know what? Other people may argue differently about that. The next person we have up is Mary Ann Shad Carey, freeborn African-American black abolitionist. And she was a Canadian resident here in the 1850s. Now we know with Mary Ann Shad Carey that she was the first female publisher and editor in North America and she published in uh, the Provincial Freeman. She also had close relatives here in St. Catharines. So her sister, Amelia Shad um, Williamson was here and her brother-in-law was David T. Williamson. And of course, they were connected with one of the local churches and it was the Zion Baptist Church. So the Provincial Freeman, as she's writing from here, for the publication, as well as from Toronto or Windsor, and I believe Chatham as well. I could be wrong. I'll double check that. The newspaper itself was devoted to anti-slavery temperance and general literature. With the letter campaigns that she was on, and I'll mention them in a few minutes, it doesn't necessarily mean that Shad was the author of all the letters. Some people speculate that her sister Amelia was writing a lot of these letters. So Marianne Shad railed against the white community, the abolitionist community in St. Catharines. She railed against the abolition, um, the anti, excuse me, she railed against slavery, of course. And she did a few other things here in St. Catharines. She held tea meetings at the Zion Baptist Church. So that was one of them that she did. So she was an active person in the local St. Catharines community. So Mary Ann Shad was a number of things. And the reason why I'm skirting over her is because I want to give a talk about her later on. But among other things, she was an anti-slavery activist, a journalist, a publisher, a teacher, a lawyer. They said she set up a school here in St. Catharines, but I really haven't under uncovered a lot of that information about Shad here in St. Catharines with the school. But as a newspaper writer for the Provincial Freeman, definitely yes. And Marianne Shad was also affiliated with the American Missionary Association, the same one that Hiram Wilson was connected with. Next up is Benjamin Drew. Benjamin Drew was a Boston abolitionist and he only visits St. Catharines one time. And that is in 1855. So between April and June, Benjamin Drew is here in St. Catharines and he's interviewing people. But of course, he's hosted by the Reverend Hiram Wilson. Drew interviewed Wilson as well as Harriet Tubman, her three brothers and Tubman's sister-in-law. So a total of 23 people altogether. And this is for a book that he's going to write. And it was called The Northside View of Slavery. Uh, narratives of Fugitive Slaves in Canada. And it was to counter a book that was published called The South Side View of Slavery. So it was slaveholders' justifications for why people of African descent should be enslaved. So Drew decided that, you know what, I'm going to counter that. And he was commissioned to do this uh, by abolitionists in Boston, as well as the Anti-Slavery Society in Canada. What he says about St. Catharines, and just briefly, refuge for Americans escaping from the abuse and cruel bondage in their native land. So that's one of his famous quotes about St. Catharines. And you'll see at the bottom, rest for the hunted slave, rest for the soil, excuse me, soiled and foot sore fugitive. Picture of Harriet Tubman uh, from the U.S. And that's her brother, William Henry Stewart, who lived here in uh, Grantham and it's believed that that picture of her brother was taken here in St. Catharines. Next up, we have John Brown. So John Brown arrives in 
no, sorry, I want to back up. I'm going to hold there. I don't want to miss this about Marianne Shad Carey. And I'm trying to commit to memory all of this. Um, she was married here in 1856. So January 3rd, 1856. So just to back up about Marianne Shad a, a little bit further. In 1855, she's on another letter writing campaign. So she's touring Niagara, she's visited Niagara on the lake, she's visited Niagara Falls, but now there's, um, she's warring with Reverend Hiram Wilson. She's accusing him of pocketing the money that was to go to fugitive relief. So next up we have John Brown. John Brown arrives in April, 1858, and he stays for approximately 10 days. So I'm just going to skirt over him because as Sarah mentioned earlier, there's the, the blog posts that are coming out. So he's here. He's to meet with Tubman. It's a secret meeting that's held at her boarding house on North Street. And he refers to her as General Tubman. And the plan was to overthrow institutionalized slavery in the United States. What's not in the blog um, that you'll have to search for online is his plans to overthrow slavery didn't work out. He was captured in October 1859, charged with treason, and he was hanged on December 2nd in Charlestown, West Virginia in 1859. Next, we have William Howard Day. William Howard Day is a freeborn African American. He's a black abolitionist. He was born in New York State in 1825, so he was enslaved for two years of his life. Slavery was abolished in New York State in 1827. William Howard Day was an educated man. He went on to receive a degree in, over, at Oberlin College. And by 1843, so this is in between, he graduates from Oberlin in 1847, but 1843, our newspaper accounts already have him here in St. Catharines at the home of a friend at the corners of Geneva and St. Paul Street. And he has a little stenography studio in his friend's home. So getting back today, he's a skilled orator. He's a newspaper publisher and editor. Um, oh, the aligned American, aliened American, sorry. He's well connected to Ohio, Michigan, and Southwestern Ontario. In Chatham, he set up a boarding house. By October, 1857, Day is down here in St. Catharines. And of course, he's hosted by the Reverend Hiram Wilson. He gives three lectures between October and November, two at the BME Church and one at the Queen Street Baptist Church. Then, after the meeting with John Brown and Harriet Tubman that Day would have attended along with Germaine Logan, he is charged with publishing or printing John Brown's provisional constitution. So that would have been in May, 1858. Some people that I didn't include because I did not want to go too far over time was Hezekiah F. Douglas, so Hezekiah Ford Douglas, or often H. Ford Douglas or H. F. Douglas. He was also connected with the Provincial Freeman, close associate of Mary Ann Schatz, as well as Samuel Ringgold Ward, who was here in 1853. Ward was the first one to state that St. Catharines was the most Yankee town in Canada. Marianne Shad also said the same thing. She said it twice, but she said, you know, some other things about St. Catharines. Filled with Negro haters, uh, Negrophobia. She always challenged the school board. Then, of course, we have William Wells Brown who passed through here. William Wells Brown was familiar with St. Catharines from 1837. He arrived in 1855, and he was again here in 1860. So they would have been visiting abolitionists. I have Samuel, Samuel Gridley Howe on the PowerPoint because he was an abolitionist, but I don't refer to him as a visiting abolitionist during that time period. Because in 1863, when he arrived, he was an agent for the Freedmen's Inquiry Commission. 
the majority of the anti-slavery lectures took place at the old courthouse. So this is a picture that I peeped off the museum. It's from 1910. And I just love the image of the old courthouse. And to the far left, those of you that are familiar with it, that's where the market square was when it was set up during the week. So it's just the open space. That's the wrap. With special thanks to the staff at the St. Catharines Museum and Welland Canal Center. And I want to thank everyone. Thank you for inviting me to speak during this Black History Month for 2021. I also want to thank the following people. Gail Benjafield, board member of the Historical Society of St. Catharines. Dennis Gannon, past president of the society. Adam Montgomery, who tried his best to walk me through PowerPoints and virtual, um, virtual uh, presentations. And I want to thank you for that, Adam. Adam. Brian Prince, who's out um, in Buxton, he provided me with a piece of information for this, as well as Bill Stevens, past, has, excuse me, past president of the Historical Society of St. Catharines. So these folks either provided me with research material in the past or an idea for the virtual presentation. Lastly, I want to express my gratitude to everyone who attended this virtual presentation. Greatly appreciated. And Tubman Tours Canada, please follow me on Facebook. What, what I post on there is a uh, pretty light stuff. Um, it's informative, but I don't get a lot of, don't give a lot of my tour information away, of course. Thank you. Sarah, I'm going to pass it back to you now. Oh my gosh, Rochelle, thank you so much. That was fascinating, just fascinating, just to think of all of these abolitionists that we've read in history books, made their way to St. Catharines for meetings and all different sorts of abolition activity, just the way that you presented it, where they were all at one point in St. Catharines, like, we were such a hub. It was really fascinating. Thank you so much. You're welcome. And the main thing about it, it was they were all interconnected between Ohio, Michigan, all the northern states and um, upper Canada or Canada West. Oh, and you can, that's what's so fascinating. You really get to see that network, how the network worked and how St. Catharines really was a central hub in that network. Oh, Rochelle, that was fantastic. Um, okay, uh, I want to get to some discussion. Um, I'm going to check the, the YouTube comments. For uh, those still listening, um, if you have any questions at all about tonight's presentation uh, for Rochelle, please post them in the YouTube chat box um, to the right hand side of your screen. And if you're using a tablet or smartphone, uh, you might not be able to see the chat box right away. Um, so you can put your questions in the comment section below. I'm just going to uh, get my uh, my PowerPoint up here just to show uh, to show you guys. Um, so again, this is what the chat box looks like. Um, if you wanted to to leave any any questions for Rochelle, um, and we'll, I'll definitely be moderating a discussion um, afterwards. Um, and thank you all, everyone, for again attending tonight's lecture, uh, for all of your support um, in the season, and if you've enjoyed tonight's presentation, uh, please consider making a donation to the museum. Again, it really does make a difference. Um, to make a donation, you can either call us at 905-984-8880 or uh, email us at museum at St. Catharines dot ca. We'd also like to oh, remind everyone um, and there are many lectures to watch. All the lectures we've done so far are up on our YouTube channel. So you're welcome to scroll through our playlists and click a lecture that looks interesting to you that you wanna delve a little bit deeper into St. Catherine's history. We have, I think this is our, our 17th lecture so far uh, since we've started this in April, 2020. So lots to choose from and definitely share any lectures with uh, your family or friends. Um, we'd also like to remind you to, um, to please like, 
follow or subscribe to our social media channels, including here on YouTube to stay in the loop on any virtual programming that we have going on during our closure, um, as well as afterwards. And please also share the museum in your own social networks to help more people um, really just get into the historical adventure. And also, uh, one more thing before we get to the, to the discussion, um, if you do love the deep dive nature of our lecture series, and we also do have a podcast that might interest you as well. Um, those are our two podcasts, Museum Chat Live or One Hour in the Past. You can catch these on Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Google Podcasts. And don't forget about the rest of our uh, Black History Month programming uh, at the museum. Like Rochelle mentioned in, the, uh, in her talk today, we are really excited to have her on to also give us a, a blog series this month where she delves even deeper into the topics that she explored today in the lecture. And we're really looking forward to that. So thank you, Rochelle. Okay, I think that's it. Let me grab the uh, my other computer here to check out the YouTube comments. Okay, uh, so, wow, a lot. I'm gonna have to send these to you, Rochelle. Lots and lots of positive uh, comments here. Um, Can I, I ask do a have, um, what's that? Can I ask a question? Oh my gosh, yes. Was I too long or too short? I could have listened to you forever. <laughs> <laughs> I should have um, kept the four in. <laughs> you know what? Um, it was it's really interesting to hear you talk about the breadth, the, the, the amount of abolitionists who really didn't make their way to St. Catharines. Um, and I liked hearing the, the, the snippets of how they all were connected to each other, but also to the city, right? Um, so I, I thought it was really interesting. And we can always have you back on to delve deeper into any one of those abolitionist stories in the future. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, we do have some questions. Um, I'm going to start at the, uh, okay, so we have Des, Des Corin asks, um, did William Howard Day write and print John Brown's constitution here in St. Catharines? Yes, in my opinion, it was from the St. Catharines Journal, but there's a clue that states that it may have been from another printing press, so I have to look deeper into that, but right now, my research leads me to the office of the St. Catharines Journal. Okay, thank you for that insight, Rochelle. Uh, we also have one from uh, Isabel who, write, who asks, um, very interesting, interesting thread connecting through Oberlin College as well. Is that why Anthony Burns wound up here as well, do you think? No, with Burns, it was a different uh, situation. He went to Indiana after he graduated and received his theological de degree. Then he was run out of Indiana because of the racial restrictive codes. Um, there was an opening at Zion Baptist Church, and that's because two ministers um, misbehaved. I'll say it lightly, misbehaved, and they were in need of a pastor, and that's why Burns ended up here. So he was fleeing from Indiana and the U.S., and he too wanted to settle on British soil. Okay, thank you for describing that in more detail. Thank you for that. I uh, just going down lots of positive comments, lots of thank yous and fabulous presentations. So again, thank all of you. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Rochelle. Um, okay, we also have one from uh, Carol who asks, are there members of uh, the family still in the area of the visiting abolitionists you mentioned. Uh, they were here for a while. Families? Yeah. Um, just the Shad family. Just okay. the Shad family still resides in Niagara. So okay. a branch of the Shad family. Okay, so the okay, so a branch of the Shad family, um, and then otherwise, I guess so many of these abolitionists were rooted in other parts of Canada and the states. So I, I do imagine they would have gone back to the states. Yes. So uh, everybody died in the U.S. Um, Hiram Wilson died here in St. Catharines. Then he his body was um, sent to Ohio, and he was um, buried there. And Willis, Reverend Michael Willis. He retired and moved on to Scotland. 
So, well, he actually settled in London, then he passed away in Scotland and then went back to London, but he was Scottish born. Okay, thank you. Uh, it's, it's always so great to have you just to pick your brain. You have so much knowledge and research. So it's, it's really great to just have you here to, to ask these questions. Thank you. Uh, okay, one more. Oh, we have someone else. Thank you for sharing your research. Is there a, a place online you recommend where we can read copies of abolitionist newspapers like the Provincial Freedman? That's a really great question. You can find both the Provincial Freedman as well as the um, Voice of the Fugitive online. And then, of course, there's accessible archives. There's uh, Detroit Mercy, the University of Detroit Mercy, the Black Abolitionist newspapers. Um, the Samuel May collection. They're, they're pretty much all over the place. Okay, that's great. Maybe we can uh, link to them on, um, maybe in the YouTube comments, I can link to a couple of those online sure. online pages. I can do that. I'll, I'll do that so that people who are watching can have access. Okay. That's awesome. Okay. I think that is it uh, for questions. I, I had a question, Rochelle, um, if you don't mind. Okay. <laughs> um, I, uh, let me just grab it up here. Um, again, I found this so fascinating, um, you know, being a historian of St. Catharines, just to, to see the, visually the connections of all these abolitionists really making St. Catharines a hub. And you draw on such a large range of, you know, primary historical sources that really together paint this vibrant imagery of St. Catharines as um, a hub of abolitionist activity. Um, what do you think is kind of the legacy of our city's role as this central hub? The legacy of the city's role as a central hub. Mm -hmm. If it wasn't documented, probably no one would believe it. That's number one. So that's our legacy, the documentation. Um, number two, it was always welcoming. So it's up to us to bring that awareness because most people don't know about St. Catharines. Um, they know about a few of the settlements, you know, out in southwestern Ontario, but they don't know about the wealth of history spread throughout St. Catharines, as well as other parts of Niagara. So we have to bring that to the forefront, because in all honesty, I don't think our legacy has been set yet. It has to be retold. So we do have the legacy there, but we have to retell the story so that more people are aware. Oh, Rochelle, I really like that that uh, that reflection, and and I feel like you know your talks and your the work you're doing is an inspiration into making that legacy realized. So thank, thank you, you for your advocacy. Thank you. Uh, we do have a couple other questions as well. Um, John Reap asks, uh, did American slave catchers ever venture into Canada to pursue runaways or perhaps um, attempt to to silence criticism from Canada? Into Canada, yes, many times many times. The latest one being 1860 with the John Anderson case in um, Toronto, one of the earlier ones, the Solomon Mosby affair, of course, in Niagara on the Lake in 1837. Uh, kidnappers were also here in 1835 for the Stanford family in St. Catharines. So there were many. And then, of course, there was the Nelson Hackett um, case in 1843 that Reverend Hiram Wilson was involved in. He was a correspondence for he was um, a freedom seeker who was actually extradited. But we have one prominent case here in St. Catharines that occurred in 1852 that I would rather not mention. <laughs> not now. <laughs> Fair enough. I do, I do feel like this certain topic could be a lecture on it all on its own as well. The kidnappers? 100%, mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. Well, I definitely think we do have to have you on again, Rochelle. <laughs> and we do also have a question from, um, from Adrian Petrie, our, our visitor services coordinator. He uh, would like to know a little bit more about uh, the lectures that you mentioned on a, at Town Hall. What, what do you think those were about? Always railing against uh, institutionalized slavery. So with moral suasion, of course, it was, you know, let's bring everybody together in peace and love. And let's end this. I mean, that would have continued probably for another few centuries had it not been for John Brown. We know this. Um, what intrigues me about the lectures is the visitors who were allowed to participate. So it was open to the public and anybody could 
attend these lectures. So Adrian, to answer your question, it was always about ending slavery. Um, and there were, you know, reasons for that. They would also rail against Northern, Northern merchants because at the time there was a boycott. Don't purchase anything that was produced by enslaved African-Americans such as sugar or cotton or whatnot. So you'd have a lot of anti-slavery sympathizers throughout the Northern states. They would be sympathizers and they would give money to help, you know, the Underground Railroad or, you know, whatever the case may be to help the anti-slavery movement, but they would not stop lining their pockets from Southern wealth. So they had to build their industry, their business using products that they received from the South, even while a boycott was going on. And at the same time, they would claim that they were anti-slavery sympathizers. So at the town hall, they would rail against that as well as rail against um, institutionalized slavery or chattel slavery. One thing Hiram Wilson always did, and I'd like to mention this, on Emancipation Day, not only did he discuss those two things, he would rail against that, but he would always, always, there's no account in any St. Catharines newspaper where he does not rail against British enslavers receiving compensation after the August 1st, 1834 Abolitionist Act came into effect. So that was one thing that Wilson always discussed as well, whether it be at the town hall or, you know, the Salem Chapel or anywhere else. If it was Emancipation Day, that subject was always brought up by Wilson. And that's Sarah because he did not believe if slavery was abolished in the US that any US enslaver should receive compensation. Wow. Um, well, just to add to that, so mm -hmm. I'm kind of nutty with regards to the Upper Canada enslaver, the loyalist documentation. So there's a few people maybe out there tonight who know this. I still won't give up because Wilson always railed against it. And there's a few things that were noted in newspaper accounts. So even though I've been told a million times that the documents do not exist, loyalists in Upper Canada did not receive anything, I'm still holding out because I cannot believe anybody from Upper Canada would not push back. Why did it, why did it just go to Caribbean enslavers? So I want to see that documentation. And I trust me, I've discussed it with numerous PhDs and local researchers. And I don't know, I just feel like Brother Wilson's talking to me saying, keep looking. <laughs> oh, I, I so believe in you. <laughs> and I appreciate, again, like you, you read these sources and, and you, you see the clues within them and you just dig deeper. And I mean, you're able to draw so much insight out of the, out of the sources. So thank you, Rochelle, for your work again. Thank you. Um, I do have a, one more uh, question from Isabel. Again, she asks, um, the Port Colborne Museum recently posted about ships bringing freedom seekers to Niagara through the Welland Canal. Can you suggest a source for looking deeper into this? Isabel? I've heard two accounts, um, both from scholars. Uh, one wrote a book about Tubman and it was published in 2012, 2013, and another scholar who was unpublished. So I'm not familiar with that, but what I can tell you is after the enslaved documentary was aired on TV, Port Colborne has become a request. Now they wanna to go to the top of Port Colborne, so the end of the canal, and they wanna walk where freedom seekers would have um, got off the boat or the ships and walk around that area. So I don't know much about that. I'm going to have to look into it and research. But I can tell you this, when I first heard it, I balked at it because it was written as though they were literally on the ships and continuing through each lock. And to me, that just sounded like madness. Who's gonna stay on those ships for you know three to five days. But because of that enslaved documentary, the gentleman who was discussing it said that, you know, they would actually get out here and move inland. So that's something I have to look into further why tourists are interested in it. So for two reasons. And thank you for the question. It's a great question. Yes, thank you. Thank They're you all so great much. questions.
Yes. Yes. It's, it's really great. Yeah. Thank you so much to our viewers for asking so many insightful questions. It's been really great to hear from, from everyone. And Rochelle, as always, it's so great just to pick your brain and to, to hear you share your knowledge with us. So thank you so much. We definitely have to have you on again. Thank soon. you, Sarah. Thank okay. you. It's an honor to be here. Thank you for the invite. Wonderful. Okay. Well, I think uh, that's a wrap up. Uh, thank you to our viewers. Uh, hopefully we'll have you all tune in on February 16th, where I will uh, try and follow Rochelle's brilliant, <laughs> brilliant <laughs> talk. Great. I'll be tuning in, Sarah. <laughs> oh, fantastic. <laughs> okay, oh, I love all the everyone. talks. Um, I hope everyone has a great night and we will see you on February 16th. Thanks everyone. Take care. I just want to pitch my blog again. Don't forget to look at it. It's about, what is it? Um, Tubman in 1858. I was going to say 48. Oh, yeah. Yes, yes. <laughs> she was still enslaved. <laughs> The first talk, uh, talk the first um, blog post goes out this Saturday, looking specifically at Tub Harriet Tubman, 1858. It's going to be a really interesting read, and it delves through all of that rich history, uh, even deeper than what you did today. So I'm looking forward to that for sure. Thank you so much, everyone.